Joining us tonight is Dr. Matt Zielinski, professor of philosophy at the University of San Diego, where he leads their Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy. Last week, we launched this video on universal basic income, and tonight, he's here to answer our questions. So Matt, thank you for taking the time to meet with us tonight. My pleasure. I'm really looking forward to it. So I want to begin with a really broad question, which is, how did you get excited or get involved with doing research on the universal basic income? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, and I, maybe instructive uh, for those students who might be going on to consider an academic career, because um, I think it's not that uncommon a story. Uh, it happened largely by accident. Uh, I was working as a political philosopher um, with interests in liberal and libertarian political theory in particular. And uh, this, was, this was probably about 12 years ago now, actually. Uh, so I was pre-tenure uh, and looking to get as many publications as I could. Uh, and somebody uh, wrote me who was editing a journal called, the, uh, called Basic Income Studies uh, that was hosting a special issue on libertarianism and the basic income. They'd done previous issues on feminism and the basic income and you know, civic republicanism and the basic income. And so they wanted to get a number of people who had some familiarity with libertarian thought um, to say what they thought about a basic income. And I'd never thought about the basic income uh, before in my life, uh, it, but it sounded like an interesting idea. And again, uh, I didn't have tenure, so I wanted to get any publication that I could to, to shore that up. Uh, so I accepted the invitation, wrote the paper, and thought that it would be the only thing I ever wrote on that subject. Um, but I found that people were just really interested in it. Uh, and, and people kept asking me to talk about it or to write more things about it. And so like a good entrepreneur, I, I focused my production on uh, where I saw the consumer demand. I mean, there was a lot of uh, a lot of interest in this topic, both from other academics and from people in the general public, politicians, a lot of um, you know, people with actual political power were considering implementing something like a basic income. Uh, and I thought it was a, a genuinely important and interesting idea. So uh, I was happy to continue doing the work as long as, as people were interested in, in reading what I had to say. Um, so we have some questions that have already been pre-submitted and then we have some questions that are coming in live. So I'm gonna work a little bit through those. And the first question is, what's the worst UBI example you've ever heard of? <laughs> uh, yeah, I did say that some ideas were, were bad, right, in, uh, in my talk, I think. Uh, and boy, gosh, I don't want to, I'm a little hesitant to call out names here. But uh, look, I won't say it's the worst, because in many ways, it's a, it's a very sophisticated and well thought out proposal. Um, but it's one that I think is, is wrong. Um, and and um, illustrative of, I think, the kind of approach to a UBI that, uh, that, that certainly is, is very foreign to the approach that I myself take. Um, so, you know, one of the best known authors on the basic income, and, and one of really the old people who's been writing about the basic income for a long period of time, is a, a philosopher named Philippe von Parijs, uh, who um, has this idea of, of real freedom. Um, and, um, that he that drives his approach to thinking about the acts of capitalism and markets and government intervention in the economy. He thinks that the government should work to you know, regulate and manage markets so as to maximize people's real freedom. And by real freedom, he means their, their actual ability to do the things they want to do, not just the formal freedom that he thinks you know, sort of people who, who favor sort of small, limited government uh, support, right? Uh, the fact that, you know, the, the, the homeless person sleeping under the bridge is as free to, you know, start a company uh, and, and eat, uh, sleep at the Four Seasons as, you know, Bill Gates is, uh, is, is a kind of empty freedom on Von Price's view. So he wants to maximize real freedom. And that means giving people the material means to accomplish their desires. So he thinks that we should have a basic income that as at is as large as can be sustainably managed, right? So the goal here is to um, take as much money from the wealthy and the middle classes as possible, compatible with leaving them some incentive 
to work and actually produce the wealth that we're going to be taking from them and give all of that money in the form of a basic income. To me, that's, that's the wrong approach to thinking about a basic income. Uh, I think that would have very bad uh, impacts on long-term economic growth, uh, on people's incentive to work. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's premised on a view of the goal of a basic income, which is quite foreign to my own, which again is providing people with sufficiency, uh, not, not equality, uh, and not a kind of maximum ability to do whatever they might want to do, regardless of, of whether they've earned that, um, that ability through their own efforts. Okay. Uh, we have a question here from one of my colleagues. Uh, first, he wants to thank you for your video. He thought it was very well done, very well articulated, and he loved the historical combination of history, philosophy, and economics on the subject matter. And his question is, realistically, who or what might be impediments to venturing into some type of UBI in the United States? Uh, lots of people <laughs> and, and ideas and institutions, right? I mean, I think we are still a, a long ways off from something like a UBI becoming politically feasible. Um, you know, there are significant concerns about the cost of a UBI. Um, you know, we want a UBI that is large enough to make a significant difference in people's lives, but also isn't so large that it's going to break the bank, uh, so to speak. And so finding a way of doing that that's economically feasible is, is difficult. Um, the way I proposed in my presentation is one way, but it requires cutting back on some existing government programs which as you know, is, is difficult to do. Every existing government program creates its own entrenched interest group uh, that tends to fight very hard for the preservation of that program. So you know, cutting back on those things is, is not gonna be easy. And then in addition to concerns about cost, you also have kind of more moralistic concerns about the importance of work. Uh, a lot of people think that it's wrong to give money to people for nothing. Um, that this encourages laziness and dependency and that people uh, have a right to a hand, a hand up, right, if they're making some efforts on their own, but that the unconditional nature of a UBI is, is the wrong way of going about structuring a social safety net. You also have people on the left uh, who think that a basic income would leave people worse off than they currently are under our existing you know, kind of hybrid uh, system of, of welfare that has some cash transfers, but also a bunch of uh, means tested and um, in-kind transfer programs. So there's a lot of opposition to it. Um, I think you know, the, the most that you're gonna see in the short-term future is small scale experiments uh, at, at the city level, maybe something at the state level, if you've got a smaller state like you know, Maine um, uh, or, or, um, or New Hampshire. Um, and maybe some UBI-like program at the federal level uh, that's, that's not quite a UBI, but has a lot of elements in common with it, like a cash transfer that's broadly unconditional or, uh, or universal. So for instance, uh, Mitt Romney has this proposal for a child uh, credit, um, which is a cash grant to parents with children um, based on the number of children they have. Um, which is largely unconditional and universal, um, but, but not quite what a UBI is. And, and that actually has, seems to have a lot of bipartisan political support, maybe not enough to actually be implemented, but um, it, it might be that something like a child credit is the most plausible way for something like a UBI to, to get traction at the, at the federal level in the United States. Okay, and as a segue, you were talking about how in your plan, we would have to eliminate some of the existing uh, welfare state mechanisms such as uh, TANF and SNAP. And I guess the question that our uh, listener has is, there are a lot of Americans who rely on the existing uh, programs at the federal level, and it's their sole uh, source of support and removing them would hurt them. So what they wanna know is how do you choose which Americans uh, you're willing to help more than others? Well, um, with, the, with the proposal that I laid out, which again is borrows heavily from um, a, a proposal made in much more detail by um, the two scholars, Daniel Hemel and Miranda Fleischer, 
Um, under that proposal, the, uh, the basic income would be universal. So everybody would receive a cash grant. And then the question is, okay, if, if that cash grant is substituting for these existing transfer programs, is that gonna make people better off or worse off, generally speaking? And based on the analysis that they did, and I haven't done this analysis myself, but I, I trust their reporting, um, based on the analysis they did, most lower income families would be better off. The vast majority of lower income families would be better off under a basic income than under the existing welfare system. Um, so I think that's, that's good. That's an attractive feature of, of that proposal for me. I think, you know, you don't, it's hard enough to scrap existing programs given the entrenched political you know, support that those tend to generate. Um, but if you're actually gonna be making people on the bottom end of the income distribution worse off by doing so, then it, I think becomes both more politically difficult and less attractive. Um, so the fact that, you know, not everybody, right? Depending on you know, people's family situations are unique, but uh, the fact that most families are gonna be made better off under this proposal is I think a, a mark and its advantage. And that's just looking at cash transferred in, right? I mean, we're, and again, I think one of the advantages of a basic income, which I can't remember if I talked about in the, in the uh, presentation or not, is um, that it really eases things for recipients of these transfers insofar as it's a consolidated cash transfer that doesn't require them to fill out six different sets of forms for six different welfare programs or visit three different offices on the other side of town. Uh, so when you factor in those kinds of administrative uh, difficulties, I think that makes the, the program even, even more attractive apart from just the, um, the financial bottom line. And then on the flip side, why give wealthy people money under a UBI plan? Right. Uh, so with a universal basic income, everybody receives uh, the grant, right? So it's not conditioned on whether you're working and at least on the proposal that I set out, it's also not conditional on um, your level of income or, or wealth. There are alternative proposals that are like a basic income that do make the grant conditional on, on income. And so one of the most well-known of those proposals is uh, an idea called the negative income tax that was first proposed famously by uh, the economist Milton Friedman. Uh, so under the negative income tax, the idea is we set a, a, a threshold for tax liability, say it's $10,000 a year, meaning that if you make less than $10,000 a year as an individual, you don't pay any taxes. If you make more than $10,000 a year, you pay taxes. Um, that's how the system works. Now, the idea of a negative income tax then is that um, for those making less than $10,000, for those earning under the income threshold, the tax threshold, uh, they would receive money from the government uh, at a certain rate. So if we had a 20% rate, say, 20% uh, negative income tax, and you earned zero, um, then you would get a $2,000 check uh, from the government, right? So 20% of the difference between $10,000 and zero. And then that number would decrease as your income went up, up to the point where you hit $10,000 and then you would start paying taxes. Under that kind of system, um, people whose income exceeded the income tax, the negative income tax threshold wouldn't receive anything. Only people who were relatively low income would receive something. Essentially, whether you go with a negative income tax proposal or whether you go with a basic income, you can design the system in such a way that they're functionally equivalent, right? So here are three different families, uh, A, B, and C, sort of zero, earning zero uh, dollars, thirty thousand dollars a year, and sixty thousand dollars a year. Uh, under this first proposal, we're giving people a UBI of six thousand dollars a year. That's five hundred dollars a month, combined with a twenty percent tax on all non-UBI income. The second case involves a negative income tax, the twenty percent. Um, tax rate uh, with an income threshold of $30,000. And as you can see, the net gain and loss here is the same, right? So the only difference is, are you sort of mailing out the checks and then taxing it back? Or are you not mailing out the checks and then you don't have to tax it back afterwards? Um, there's some administrative savings to a negative income tax in theory, right? You don't have to sort of give and then take back. Um, but I think there is a, a kind of simplicity advantage to the UBI where everybody gets the money. 
Um, you, know, you, don't, you get the money to people in advance uh, when they might need it rather than sort of waiting till tax time uh, when it might be too late to meet their needs. And there's a kind of, um, from a more kind of psychological level, uh, I think it's easier to get public buy-in into a program that is perceived as benefiting everybody rather than a public program that is perceived as only being welfare for the poor. Um, that's, a, that's a rhetorical point. And as a philosopher, I tend to kind of discount that stuff and say, well, that, that shouldn't really matter. But you know, the fact is that does matter in politics. And so if you think like I do that a basic income is a good idea, then I think there's good reason to go with a plan that, um, that looks better, uh, you know, as long as it's not in any functional way worse than the alternative. And I think that's, uh, that's true of the UBI as compared to the negative income tax. Okay, and I guess this is a practical question. So in theory, we can talk about a UBI, but when it comes to say rubber hitting the road and we have to distribute monies, there are Americans out there that are just have fallen through the cracks. So we have some folks who are homeless, they're unsheltered. We, they're just people who are citizens that we just can't find and who probably would benefit the most from UBI. How do we put in a system where we can actually track them down and get the resource to them? Yeah, uh, that is a, a, a very good question. Um, so I think, you know, you want to build as much as you can on top of existing infrastructure. Um, so, you know, right now, the most comprehensive system that we have for sort of tracking people's income and, and sort of addresses and things like that is the income tax system, right? That, that, that's a, that's a well-established mechanism by which people sort of are used to filing every year and then getting money back from the government. So I think there's something to be said for building the basic income on top of the income tax system, using that system as a, as a mechanism for uh, making distributions. But as you said, there are people who are falling through the cracks of that system, right? People who don't file for income taxes. We have the social security system as well. Um, and so you can, you can use the social security system as, a, as maybe even a more comprehensive system. Whichever system you use, you're gonna have people falling through the cracks. Um, and you're probably never gonna get 100% pickup um, with a basic income. Uh, you don't get 100% pickup with any social welfare program. Uh, so if you look at the, at the pickup rates for SNAP or TAN for a lot of the other programs that we have in the United States, um, they're, they're shockingly low in many cases. And the more complicated, the more onerous the system is for registering and receiving the benefits, the lower the pickup rate tends to be. So I think the, the most you can hope for is a basic income that's gonna have a higher pickup rate than, than existing programs. And then, right, you, you do what you can in terms of, you know, having a public outreach campaign to get people to, to register um, for a social security number or to, to put their name in the system um, in order to receive the benefits to which they're entitled. But, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough problem to get everybody or as many people as you can. And then we have another question dealing with politics and the UBI. Is there a concern that if it were enacted that this could become politically weaponized against certain groups of people? I guess I'm not totally sure what the questioner has in mind there uh, in terms of it being weaponized. Um, and, uh, and maybe I can't, maybe I can't ask for clarification in this context. Um, but uh, I mean, so if, if, if I have to kind of guess at what that, that might mean, um, you know, perhaps the concern is that we might exclude uh, certain people from eligibility for the basic income based on kind of political considerations. Um, that is a possibility, right? And, I, and again, eligibility is, is kind of a key issue in structuring the basic income, right? who's, who's eligible for the benefit. Uh, under the proposal that I laid out, it's um, all, ch all children and uh, adults in the United States, all citizens, um, but that rules out non-citizens, right? And so the question of where immigrants fit into the basic income program is a, is a contentious one. I could also see um, questions being raised maybe about felons, right? Maybe some people will mobilize to exclude uh, felons from, from eligibility for the basic income. I think uh, those are all legitimate concerns. Um, and 
uh, and their problems that um, that would need to be dealt with in, in designing and implementing a basic income. I think what the basic income has going for it, again, is this universality, um, which um, I think makes it harder to uh, rig in favor of certain groups and against other groups than other non-universal programs, right? Like if you've got a whole bunch of different welfare programs with complex sets of eligibility um, and different interest groups attached to each of them, that sets up a system where it's fairly easy to manipulate those rules in a kind of backhanded way uh, to benefit some groups and hurt others. On the other hand, if you have a single universal and relatively transparent system like the basic income, that I think is much harder to manipulate, which is why you have some um, theorists who are very concerned about manipulability and transparency, like James Buchanan, for instance, from the founders of the discipline of public choice economics, thought that you know, a basic income, you know, if you're gonna have some kind of redistribution at all, the basic income is the right way to do it precisely because it's less manipulable, which is not to say not manipulable, but it's less manipulable than other transfer programs that, uh, that, that currently are on the table. And we have a family of questions that kind of talk about the same topic. And the question really is, does a UBI impact other forms of regulation? For example, would a UBI protect people from rent increases or arbitrary price increases or how are those things separate? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so it depends on who you ask, but since you're asking me, I'll tell you my, my theory about all of this, right? So I, I think that capitalism, right, that, that, that dynamic market economies have an awful lot of things going for them in their favor. Um, but, but capitalism creates a lot of creative destruction, right? So in this process of generating wealth, um, old ways of doing business are destroyed, new ways come up. And in the long run, that process makes us all better off. But in the short term, it can cause a lot of discomfort and, and real suffering, right? So if you've been in a particular line of work for 40 years and all of a sudden your industry is kaput because some new technological innovation destroyed it or new foreign trade with China or whoever destroyed it and you're out of a job and somebody tells you, well, you know, train yourself for something new, that could be really hard to do, right? Like your children will adjust, but for you, uh, you might be in a difficult situation. So I think, one of the goals of a social welfare policy should be to smooth the rough edges of, of the kind of creative destruction that capitalism unleashes, right? Um, to, to make it a little bit easier for us to adjust to those transitions so as to give all of us more of a reason to buy into that system, right? We don't want the kind of political disaffection and economic disruption that capitalism can cause to lead people to make uh, radical uh, and, and ultimately, I think, very dangerous and destructive um, restrictions upon that system. Uh, and so one of the things that a UBI can do is allow us to, get back to the question about regulations, right, to kind of let it rip, to let capitalism rip, let foreign trade rip, uh, let, let the market rip, you know, get rid of the minimum wage and let employers set prices in response to you know, conditions of supply and demand. And then if you've got concern for the ability of low income workers to provide themselves, which is a perfectly reasonable concern to have, then put that on the basic income, right? Don't muck around with the price system and put you know, price uh, floors on, on labor. Let the price system do what it's good at, which is allocating resources efficiently, and then do your transfer via some other mechanism that's well designed to accomplish that particular goal. So I think it can actually free us up from a lot of harmful and inefficient regulation uh, that's designed to uh, achieve goals really that it's, 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 not, um, it's not really effective at, at, at uh, achieving. Okay. And we're starting to wind down. So I want to give you a little bit of time to tell us what you think the biggest takeaway you'd like our audience to walk away with tonight happens to be. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, when, when we're thinking about a basic income, right, it's the biggest takeaway uh, really is 
the devil's in the details, right? Um, and, and this is true, especially so of the basic income, but I think it's true of a lot of other public policies where we're talking about a, a carbon tax or whether we're talking about uh, government-sponsored health insurance. You know, we have these big labels for policy ideas um, that often kind of rally a number of people either in favor or against these policies. Uh, but if you if you look closely at these things, what you find very often is it's it's not just one idea; it's a whole bunch of different ideas, uh, some of which might be really good and others of which are really bad. And often the difference between those two depends on what might appear to be kind of boring matters of policy design. But those boring matters of policy design are precisely what. Uh, determine the difference between a, a policy that's going to make people you know, economically prosperous and, and successful or economically destitute. So um, that's true, especially of the basic income. I think, as I said, there's a lot of bad basic income proposals out there. Uh, and there are a lot, or some at least, <laughs> that I think uh, have a lot to be said for them. Um, but it's, it's really all in the, in the details of policy design. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't get a chance to ask you, could you tell us a little bit about your Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy down at the University of San Diego? Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy is a center I founded back in 2016. And it really grew out of my, my own interest at the intersection between those disciplines. As, as I mentioned, I was trained as a political philosopher, but I've always thought that the important questions of public policy uh, are ones that require interdisciplinary analysis. Philosophers have something to add to that conversation in terms of our thought about uh, justice and fairness, but uh, you can't get far in thinking about public policy without thinking about how stuff works, right? Uh, and what the unintended effects of, of good intention policies might be, uh, how things are actually gonna work once you put them through the political process. So I think getting those interdisciplinary conversations up and going is, is a key to making progress about uh, thinking about public policy and a key for preparing students to deal with our world, which is, a, which is an interdisciplinary world. So uh, that's really what we try to do at the center through our events. We host uh, interdisciplinary events where we have debates and talks and panels on um, issues like gun control and immigration from, uh, from a variety of different disciplinary and ideological perspectives. And then uh, through our undergraduate uh, PPE program, philosophy, politics, and economics, which uh, introduces students to the ways in which these, these, these different disciplines connect with each other, uh, the way in which insights from one discipline can shed light on questions asked by a different discipline. Um, and, uh, and so those are the two things we do, these public facing events, uh, like you know, the kinds of things that you put on and then the, uh, the undergraduate curriculum in, uh, in PPE. Well, Matt, thank you for your time tonight. It's amazing how fast a half hour goes. Thank you for everybody for coming tonight. We appreciate your attendance and please stay well and stay safe. And I hope to see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Derek.